Um, welcome. Um, welcome to uh, Climate Analytics second event of today. Um, welcome back to those uh, who were here this morning with us. Thank you for your dedication. I see uh, some of you are, are actually <laughs> spending the whole day with us. Thank you very much. Um, Climate Analytics, for those of you who don't know us, um, is a non-profit uh, climate science and policy institute that was established in 2008. Uh, we have in Australia, all over the world. Uh, we have from the Caribbean. Uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature limit. This afternoon in two parts to set the scene and then um, it um, first we will have climate analytics and Jasmine Kanzler who will set the scene different pledges the gaps to be um, a second presentation by Dr. Player China and the United States which I'm sure is uh, of great interest on the ground in, the, in those countries. Um, that will be introduced Mr. Leon Charles' um, long-term <laughs> um, from Charles and Associate base in Grenada. So now over to you. Good afternoon, colleagues. We'll be focusing on the question of the urgency, as you know, but we need to do it at a particular two things. On first of all, why we need to do it with the panel after the first set of presentations, we we'll talk a little bit about what, especially in the period between introducing. I think we all know Bill, or resident experts on the cat from climate analytics. So, Bill, over to you. Thanks, Leon. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of where we stand on the Paris Agreement impl implementation. Um, at the heart of the Paris Agreement, of course, are the nationally determined contributions of parties, which in the end have to add up to um, an emission pathway that will get us to one and a half degrees. And I think as everyone knows, the present level of ambition is far from what is needed. This is an analysis from the Climate Action Tracker's most recent uh, global ana analysis, which shows that there is a very large emission gap between where we need to be um, uh, from current policies and down to the emission pathways for uh, one and a half degrees. We've shown as reference also the former two degree pathway uh, as well. Um, so that's um, a bit of an interesting proposition, really, is the Paris Agreement being implemented or not. I'm going to step through where we stand on that. Um, the nationally uh, determined contributions are assessed, 30-odd plus of them, by the Climate Action Tracker regularly um, and labelled according to categories such as critically insufficient, in which the US, uh, Russian Federation and Saudi Arabia sit at present highly insufficient, insufficient, two degree compatible. As you can see, by far the majority of countries are insufficient or highly insufficient. In other words, their national commitments um, are far from where they need to be to close that emissions gap uh, from the point of view of their own national economies. So we assess that many countries have simply not made enough commitments to come close to where they need to be, taking into account a range of different assessments of their fair contribution to meeting the global long-term temperature goal of the Paris Agreement. Now, um, there have been some small and positive changes, and this is a, an analysis we did uh, last year for the Climate Action Tracker. We're in the process of updating it, so I hope we don't have to revise our numbers adversely. Let's see. Um, I don't have any inside information on that at present, so I don't feel embarrassed in any sense. But um, the previous 2016 assessment had current policies pushing us towards 3.6 degrees warming, a long way from 2 degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees. Last year we had assessed that there had been a, a modest improvement due to actions uh, taken by China, uh, India and other parts of the, the globe which reduced that overall assessment to 3.4 degrees warming, a 
small but non, um, not trivial change in the outlook. But I guess more importantly, we, we looked ahead a bit and said, what if the future plans that governments are, being, uh, are talking about but haven't actually put into place yet, what if they actually transpired? So we made a hypothesis, I guess, added those up, and we came up with 3.1 degrees of warming, really a bigger improvement overall. Now, we're in the course of testing this hypothesis now. Um, we will have results ready for the COP, but this shows that um, despite the, the overall pessimism about Paris in some quarters, we are seeing a lot of positive actions out there um, which haven't offset the negative actions going on. So, um, one of the big developments, of course, is the development in renewable energy. Um, and in the national context, this is significant enough to lead the Climate Action Tracker team to revise down with some national projections. So it's not um, a boutique issue, it is affecting national emission levels uh, quite significantly, both in the, in the short and longer term. So uh, the US emissions downwards because of ongoing penetration of renewables into the electric system in the US, in Chile, um, also uh, new developments there in renewable energy, backing out of coal plants led to lower emissions. Argentina, um, the European Union is now also considering increasing its own renewable target uh, significantly, which would have a, a small but non-trivial effect in lowering its future emissions as well. So overall, um, we see the opportunity for countries now to actually improve their NDCs. Um, overall, um, since these were put forward in around 2014-2015 period, uh, renewable energy prices have dropped, uh, storage technology has dropped, electric vehicle prices have dropped, and so on. So there is the opportunity then for NDCs, just from that narrow economic point of view, to be upgraded significantly as a consequence of these developments. Now, um, renewables are becoming cheaper faster than expected, leading to uh, more uh, accelerated decarbonisation of the power sector. Um, and these are leading to a virtual cycle of further decreasing uh, costs in the power sector contributed to by support policies globally. And these are having, in some places, reduced uh, air pollution benefits for countries. Now, um, in the uh, freight transport area, we've looked at this. There are very interesting developments in, for example, fuel cell electric, electric trucks powered by renewable energy included in the United States, something which a Climate Action Tracker report first really brought to attention a few months ago. It's quite a significant development. Uh, US manufacturer Nikola is reported to have over 9,000 orders for fuel cell electric trucks powered by renewable hydrogen. Very uh, interesting and possibly strategic development. Overall, the future in transport is pretty much electric and there's a lot of positive developments here. I, I won't go through them in detail. So I'm sure you are familiar with many of them, but a number of countries have set targets for electric vehicles, are introducing policies and, and, and uh, modalities for encouraging electric vehicle uptake. So this is developing quite quickly. Now, um, <clears throat> in the industrial area, we also see some uh, potential developments in uh, steel and hydrogen, uh, <clears throat> displacing carbon. Uh, Sweden, for example, is pressing ahead with uh, renewable hydrogen uh, linked to steel production, advancing coal and um, displacing, or I should say, displacing coke and coal from the, power, uh, from the uh, steel sector. Once again, this is driven very much by um, reductions in renewable energy prices that are surprising even analysts in their rate and extent. Um, in the recent times, we've seen the development of a powering past coal alliance, um, which is uh, accumulating more and more countries as time goes by, and be beginning to build some global momentum towards a backing out of coal. Not everywhere, not in all places, but definitely having a very positive effect. South Africa has announced plans which, if given full effect, would significantly reduce its coal burden in the next decades. Germany has launched a coal commission, which is now looking at the prospect of a phase-out schedule for coal if it works successfully. Chile has announced an end to coal. And I think this is, in the case of Chile, built very much around the, the 
increased benefits of renewable energy in the Chilean economy, including for its uh, energy intensive mining sector. Uh, this is not happening um, <clears throat> in everywhere. We see quite a few countries, um, India, uh, sorry, Indonesia, um, Turkey, Poland, uh, still investing heavily in coal and governments uh, in the expansion of coal and some governments in the developed world, particularly Australia and the United States, still pushing ahead with trying to keep coal in the power market despite um, the economics dictating otherwise. So overall, a fairly mixed picture on coal. Um, some countries are pushing ahead with expansion. Um, others are beginning to think about phase outs. South Africa itself is shifting away, a fairly coal intensive economy that's now looking ahead to a renewable future. Um, and in other, other places, um, coal is being kept in the market simply through political economy issues. That is, government supporting uh, coal in places where it's otherwise uneconomic. Interestingly, in the financing area, we're seeing an uh, increasing number of banks. Uh, Standard Chartered just recently, for example, announced it won't be financing any new coal power plants anywhere, anytime. So it comes on top of a number of Japanese finance uh, entities saying the same thing, withdrawing from coal finance throughout Asia. So um, I think I can skip over that because we've covered that already. The point now is, okay, the Paris Agreement has got some mixed um, messages going on in the implementation area. There's some very positive messages about implementation happening in places and in a lot of other countries not enough happening or even the opposite going on with further investments in coal. Now the Talanoa Dialogue which has been uh, set up um, this year under the Fijian pre Presidency is convening in Poland and has the ambition to provide guidance going forward on uh, the enhancement of NPCs to be submitted by 2020. The enabling decisions of the Paris Agreement taken in Paris in 2015 required uh, countries to be prepared to submit updated NDCs, I won't use the formal language, meant to be increasing ambition by 2020. So right now this year, we're looking at the uh, initiation of that process supported by the IPCC one and a half degree special report. Um, which uh, is meant to provide the scientific and technical basis for parties to begin considering how to increase the ambition of their own NPCs <coughs> as well as provide the global pathway guidance as to what that enhanced ambition should add up to in order to get into a one and a half degree pathway. So the next stage of the uh, talk now will be going through a number of questions relating to a few of the countries and major regions that really count in this game. And so I'd like to hand over to, I think, Jasmine, you're next. Thanks, Bill. So Nicholas and I, sort of representative of the Climate Action Tracker, are now going to lead you through some of the developments of, of major emitting countries. Um, and I will start with India and the European Union, and Nicholas will then follow on the United States and China. So let's look at the Paris Tango a bit more up close. Starting with India, India remains on track to overachieve its uh, current NDC targets. So you see here uh, the famous CAD graphic. So um, and do you, can I, I can point. So you see the blue line here is the current policy trajectory, which um, significantly lies below the targets that India has set themselves. India remains and is one of the most dynamic and vibrant markets in the world for renewable energy. And it in fact could become a global climate leader with a 1.5 compatible rating if it accelerates renewable energy and continues to back out of building coal-fired power plants. And this seems feasible, especially if you consider the following four points. One, at least the draft national electricity plan contain no expansion of coal-fired power plants. Secondly, there is a significant added value in the transition towards renewables by aiding India to overcome energy poverty and advance sustainable development, which is increasingly recognized. Thirdly, renewable energy share of new capacity additions for power generation has been the largest at around 60% over the last two years, while the additions to coal-fired generation's capacity have slowed sharply. And then lastly, India, among other uh, countries, was in the top five of total installed renewable power capacity by the end of 2017. 
Now the picture in the transportation sector, as with many countries, is a bit more in the infancy um, uptake starting points. And supposedly also because of that, the government signals right now remain a bit mixed. Um, so there has been an initial target of stopping to sell um, fossil fuel cars by 2030. Now um, there are different uh, interpretations and government representatives who, who speak about a 30% target or even a 15% target. So that, mixture, uh, that message right now is a bit mixed. The currently sporadic uptake of EV technology, however, could benefit tremendously from um, clearer policy signals in that area, for example, by mandating action plans at a national level and working towards the earlier aim of all new vehicles being electric by 2030. Moving into the European Union, meanwhile, is um, trying to reclaim its position as a global leader on climate action. So the more ambitious renewable energy and efficiency target that were adopted in uh, 2018 in June are estimated to increase the emissions reductions goal from 40% to around 45%. And this would move the current NDC target here a bit further downwards, so a bit more into the right direction. So while at the same time of the political discussion around more ambitious renewable energy, energy efficiency and emission reduction goals, the EU's emissions began increasing again in 2017, which highlights again a point that Bill made in his earlier presentation um, to accelerate the coal as well as natural gas phase out and the phase in um, of renewables. In fact, 10 of the EU member states representing around 26% of the EU's installed coal capacity have already committed to closing their power plants by 2030 at the latest, and others, including Germany, are planning to decide upon uh, coal phase-out dates. So as I just uh, already mentioned here in brackets, but just uh, to make that strong point here again, natural gas will also be, have to cons be constrained within the Paris Agreement. So that means that despite European institutions and some EU member states increasing their support for the development of natural gas infrastructure, it will likely increase the dependency on energy imports, it risks created stranded assets and jeopardize meeting the Paris Agreement goals. And just personally, I would wish that the role of renewable energy would, play, would be increasingly recognized uh, in striving towards energy security and energy independence. On the question of ambition within the European Union, there are many uh, examples one could mention. To start with, on the member states, there are some EU member states that call for increased ambition. So Germany, Austria, Portugal, and Luxembourg are calling on the EU to consider increasing its 2030 goal, with the Dutch Prime Minister calling for a target of 55% below 1990 levels by 2030, which again would then significantly move the target uh, closer to where it it needs to go for Paris compatibility. Meanwhile, on the Commission level, we have uh, Mr. Caneta, the European Union's Climate Action and Energy Commissioner, who started a discussion also around um, increasing the ambition of the NDC, increased renewable energy and energy efficiency targets. And that is a development that again underlines and demonstrates the changing energy landscapes and the opportunities and the springboard for action that it provides. And hopefully many other countries will start reflecting on those de cost developments and reductions and hence potential for increasing ambition in the next round of NDCs in 2020. Equally important uh, is the long-term strategy. So the European Union's present target for 2050 is not compatible with the Paris Agreement, which has been recognized, and consultations on the EU long-term emissions reduction strategy have started, and they aim to um, present a draft by the end of March 2019, which is an opportunity for the European Union to increase climate action to reflect the Paris Agreement. And there are different... Um, goals out there, and one of them includes a goal of climate neutrality by 2050, which has been suggested by different stakeholders, including the European Parliament, along with some of the largest European cities and others. So this is sort of a quick snapshot of those two countries, and without further ado, I would hand over to Nicholas to hear about the other presentations. Oh, sorry if I'm cutting <laughs> Leo out of the moderating. Thank you, and uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak here on uh, climate actions in the U.S. and in China. 
Um, uh, the work is based on the climate action tracker that we do together with climate analytics and ECOFIS. Also, two more reports, one that we do with PBL, that's the Dutch Environmental Assessment Agency, and IASA for the European Commission. And another one that we just uh, published two weeks ago on with the Yale University and also PBL on the activities of non-state actors, so cities, regions, and businesses, is particularly relevant for the U.S. Um, so, U.S. first. Um, well, you know there's uh, the, the two levels of action here. There's, on the one hand, the federal action. Let's start there. Uh, the federal government is really uh, trying to yeah, roll back a different uh, policies that had been implemented before. So there's the plan to, or tariffs on solar cells. There's delays of requirements of reducing methane in the oil and gas production. And there's uh, extensive efforts to expand uh, oil and gas exploration. So those are the efforts uh, that are made on the national level. Nevertheless, we as a climate action tracker do these updates of the current policy scenarios. That's again the blue line here. How we think that emissions will develop in the future. And again, from last year to this year, we had to decrease our projection for 2030 by 5 percent. It was mentioned before already. That is due to the faster uptake of renewables basically pushing coal out of the mix. That's simple market forces and is contrary to the trend of what um, uh, the Trump government is trying. If you look at the impact of these different measures, um, so this is the greenhouse gas emissions of the U.S. in the year 2030. In the middle is our, let's say, current policy trajectory. If the clean power plan was completely uh, cut, then emissions would be a bit higher. And if the light duty vehicle standard would also be uh, made less ambitious, emissions would go up a little bit as well, uh, only a little bit because light duty uh, vehicles they have to, well, this is by 2030 and by that time only a few of the running cars will be affected by it. So that's relatively small. What's big is the difference from where we are right now to where uh, US wanted to be under the Paris Agreement, that's the NDC. And with the climate plan of Obama, uh, they, uh, the U.S. would have made it to it, but it was still a plan. So also the uh, administration of Obama did not implement all of the actions that it wanted to then be able to reach the target. So right now we are, uh, would be missing the target if it was only for the federal actions. But uh, really the music in, in the U.S. is with uh, the cities, states, and regions. And this was a report where we for the first time looked at 10 major economies, also the U.S., in aggregating uh, the known and quantifiable commitments from cities, states, and businesses on what would happen if they would all implement their commitments. Would emissions be lower? And the bottom line is, yes, U.S. would be at least halfway to meeting its NDC if all of these commitments would be implemented. Basically, on top, you have, you have here the current policy scenario, so only with federal action. And then going down, that would be the implementation of the full commitments. The NDC is here in, in 2025, uh, so it's getting quite close. What is it made of? It's made of a commitments by states, which actually contribute large because states are large. They have ambitious long-term targets. Um, then cities, which are important as well, but they're simply smaller. That's why their impact is smaller. Then we have companies, and companies we divided by utilities a little bit, but the other companies, they have a large contribution as well. And again, it's mainly renewable energy. So these are companies that have pledged to uh, use only renewable energy and by that um, creates such a big demand that we really see that impact here on the reductions. Um, that's, I think, an encouraging uh, way forward. We've also looked at initiatives that are trying to gather more and more uh, of these actors. And these initiatives also have... So, for example, there's an initiative which is called RE100. And they want to get uh, at least 1,000 companies to subscribe to it. If they would reach that long-term goal, where would emissions be? This is not real commitments. This is more aspirational goals. And that's actually the bottom line here. So there's quite a few initiatives 
um, in the, also, also that cover the U.S. that have the goal of reducing emissions even further. Not yet real commitments, more uh, aspirational goals of these initiatives, and, uh, but encourage small print. The largest part here is cities, states, and regions. They want to get more. And the other large parts here are, again, around renewable energy. So all that says there is the potential that the U.S. can still meet its original NDC that they had and even go beyond it if one leverages all the ambition that comes from states, cities, and businesses. Next one is China. Um, China is, well, the world's largest emit emitter. We are at uh, 12 gigatons out of 50 gigatons globally. So. Whatever happens in China, whether China will be able to peak its emissions or not, this will drive whether global emissions will peak or not. And that's why all eyes are on China, looking of whether um, China can do this uh, peak of emissions. Uh, the NDC targets, that's the white and the gray areas here, um, China is set to overachieve their NDC targets. So China took a little bit of a different approach, I would say. Um, they promised something that, that was pretty sure to be achieved. Now it will probably be overachieved. That could mean that China could up its uh, NDC at the next round if, if it wishes to do so. But anyway, the positive news is that they overachieved their target. It's still not compatible with uh, 2 or 1.5 degrees. Um, China would have to do more, but at least that's where they stand right now. The question is, have, can China reach a peak of emissions? And people were very hopeful that they could, including us uh, in the Climate Action Tracker. The, we saw that emissions had an all-time high in 2014, the CO2 emissions only, and uh, there was a question whether they would go down. We still always assumed them to go up, but were hopeful that maybe uh, the growth had stopped. But unfortunately, 2017, um, was a bit of a pushback. Again, CO2 emissions were higher than ever before in China. And also, the first half of 2018 doesn't look good. Coal use is again up 3% uh, in the first half. And um, that is uh, reported to be due to more coal-fired uh, powered electricity because there was less rain and therefore less hydropower. But also, the economy picking up again, steel production uh, rising again, and therefore more use of coal. Um, so that's pointing in the wrong direction right now. There's another one uh, uh, fact that is pointing in the wrong direction. Uh, we praised uh, India and also China for cancelling plans to build new coal-fired power plants. Uh, this is still the plan, uh, but there are reports out right now that look at, um, a look at satellite uh, pictures, for example, and they basically report that these uh, plans, these constructions are still happening. So these plans are still being built, although the national governments uh, had the plan not to build them. So that's a, a worry that one needs to look out for. When China will peak, we don't know. The NDC is at least before 2030. I think all agree it can be earlier, definitely much earlier. I would say it's probably before 2020. Um, but that's something uh, that uh, we don't know Yet, that's why we have a wide range here of where we see Chinese emissions to be going. Um, the non-state actors are not that relevant uh, for China. Let's all just uh, slip, uh, skip over them. They're really more important in, in countries like the U.S. Um, as, a, as a summary, uh, the U.S., uh, the federal rollbacks have an influence on greenhouse gas emissions, but limited. I think the market forces are much higher and especially the city, states, and businesses, they are really the driving force right now in the question of whether they can pull through their ambition um, to move U.S. further. In China, it's the main uh, point um, that we don't know whether emissions uh, will peak uh, soon. They will probably peak soon, but they have not peaked yet. So the hopes that this will happen earlier, uh, unfortunately, have not come true yet, and city, states, and uh, businesses are less relevant in China. With that, I close and hand over to Liam. Okay, thank you very much. And we've had three very interesting presentations as to where things are right now. 
Um, we'll now move to the Q&A section. And can I ask the panelists to just come to the head table? Okay, so I now open the floor for questions or contributions on this first part of the of, of, of the event in terms of where we are today, what action is taking place. And um, do I see any requests for the floor? Okay, I see. Ella. Thank you. Those were very interesting presentations. I just had a quick question about China, because I know how you were explaining in the U.S. I think we all know the federal government is going one way, but the market force is basically phasing out coal. We're seeing, and in your presentation, you marked that like they are obviously coal is being built potentially. So is it is it from a market perspective? Is it just a lack of penetration of renewables? Is it? I'm just not as familiar. You know, is it just lack of solar deployment? So I'm just trying to understand why they aren't more non-state influences pushing renewables in China? Yeah, one question is the, the market forces. The market forces are there everywhere, also in China. Um, uh, but the, the main issue is that uh, planning coal-fired power plants is simply a long-term process. And it takes basically uh, 10 years or 5 to 10 years or so from planning to building it and to have it finalized and on the grid. And that's a process that's ongoing and there are forces forcing once you've started to really finish it. Uh, that's a bit different for renewables, that goes faster if you do it at a smaller scale, and that's why it's happening. The non-state actors in China, one, one caveat is actually we do not know that much about non-state actors. We know that cities and regions are pretty much aligned with the national government, that's the way how it's set up. But I assume also that there are quite a few companies being more ambitious, but we don't know much about it. They're not really on record. Um, and that would be very interesting in future research to find out what these uh, companies are. To Okay, thanks very much. And can I ask when you speak it, if you could just indicate which organization you're from so we get a sense as to where the question is coming from. Okay, any, any other requests for the floor? Uh, Ambassador Ferguson. Hi, good afternoon, and, and thank you very much for the presentations. Janine from the Permanent Mission of Belize. I'm actually quite curious. You spoke mostly about what's occurring domestically. But I'm also curious about investments, particularly from China in other countries, in particular in respect of coal. Thank you. Okay. I can start, maybe you want to add to it. But indeed, that's an issue, definitely. I mean, we see in many countries uh, that there is um, yeah, certain pressures in coal-fired power plants, and China is one of the main investors there. And that is something that needs to be watched carefully. So it's not only about domestic emissions, it's also about what countries are doing elsewhere. That applies to China, but that applies to all other countries as well, uh, whether it's positive impact or negative impact. It's something to watch closely. Yeah, I think that um, the problem of uh, Chinese um, state-owned companies uh, building or supporting or financing coal in Southeast Asia uh, parts of South Asia, uh, North and, and Eastern Africa are particularly acute. And of course the dynamics of that are that the, um, the market for these technologies is being hollowed out uh, inside China um, and that uh, the, the Chinese state-owned companies and banks are providing ways of, mar of maintaining markets for those activities uh, in those countries. But they also are tending to work with uh, other countries. We, we noted, uh, for example, Japan, Australia, South Korea is still uh, heavily investing in coal. Um, uh, that also means that they're investing in building up and supporting coal asset development, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia and uh, in the case of Japan and South Korea, also in Africa to some extent. So um, that collection of issues with Chinese state-owned companies losing business, finding markets outside China, and support from developed countries promoting coal is a cluster of issues that's quite difficult to deal with. Um, 
and is leading to the very large projections of coal growth, for example, in Southeast Asia at present. And it's something that is um, being paid a lot of attention to by European governments, uh, philanthropy and so on, but the problem is by far um, from being brought under control. We have a question at the front here. Um, hello, it's Pete Browning from Browning Environmental. Um, first question I have is on methodology. So I'm wondering if somebody could speak a little bit about the way you go about collecting this data, the, the data quality issues you have on it, um, and also the verification of the extent to which people are actually implementing commitments. Um, and the second question is, you've talked about energy, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, transport, and to, to an extent industry. But would somebody be able to speak a little bit about the effect of policy on land use, where that's at, and where the potential is on land use? Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, the, the Climate Action Tracker um, is using pretty much national level reported data where it's available or uh, we have a hierarchy of then stepping down to international sources or other ways of composing data. So um, I, I think that's about as good as you can get without top-down measurement systems and they are being developed and we're interested in working with anyone who's interested in doing that to get top-down assessments going um, from satellites, whatever means to actually track that, um, because there are notable discrepancies. Um, of course, in the US, the methane discrepancies are famous, um, but in other regions, one is also noting that there are discrepancies on hydrofluorocarbons, China, um, in nitrous oxide emissions in the European Union, for example, so that there's a bunch of issues there that need to be worked on, um, and the scientific community is working on that, but I think that that needs to be accelerated. Um, verification comes from the national reports and from um, we then evaluate uh, where we can find it, where it's available, independent uh, assessments by other parties um, of what a country is doing at sectoral or national level and try to make sense of it. Um, and it's not always easy. Um, Nicholas has alluded to issues in China um, and everyone knows about that. Um, but it's also true that in developed countries there can be very difficult issues and that leads me very directly to the land use issue um, and here I think that um, you know you're asking about land use policies but on the land use emissions uh, uh, and removal side uh, data is often uh, not very good um, or it is constructed in such a way that uh, it's very hard to work out what is actually going on in the physics of the exchange of carbon on a country's land surface. So by that I mean a country may be reporting an increased uh, storage of carbon in its forests and soils, but uh, more scientifically based top-down methods of assessing carbon fluxes might show quite the opposite. And in fact, there's a very interesting uh, paper in Nature Climate Change recently, which attempts to unpack that very well for the first time in a long time that uh, it, it, it highlights the scale of the problem. Um, often you hear commentators refer to developing countries having a problem, but if you want to look at some really big problems, you'll find them also in developed country reporting of their land surface carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions. So that is emerging to my mind as a very uh, big problem in the Paris Agreement which is attempting to globalise the land sector inside the Paris Agreement for reporting purposes. We simply don't understand enough about it. Um, I'm not an expert on land sector policies. Maybe someone else feels willing to comment on that. Nicholas? I, I can uh, give two examples. And the big, big uh, emissions are coming from deforestation countries like Brazil and Indonesia. In Brazil, has, they have made uh, quite some uh, success in reducing the deforestation rate to a, a low level. But that is under under pressure now with economic decline and uh, they're rolling back a little bit the policy so uh, and that's the problem with deforestation as soon as the policies are gone deforestation can immediately ramp up again and that's a, a huge danger in Brazil but Indonesia for example we are 
still far away from real effective measures. So there's still huge uh, deforestation emissions in Indonesia and not really a, a good way forward how to get to them. So it's a huge question, but not easy. No, we've, we've worked on uh, saving the, the forests for, for decades, so it's not, a, not an easy fix. Yeah. On verification of the data, yeah, we in the, the Climate Action Tracker, we do this since 2009, yeah, so quite a long time. Uh, we contribute our analysis to the UNEP GAP report as one of the main inputs there, and that is a comparison exercise where we compare our results to other models, which is, I think, a very good way of verifying that we're on the right track. Yeah, I mean, there's another dimension of this as well, which is if you're trying to evaluate what countries are actually doing, we, we refer to, for example, our current policy projections, which countries policies added up actually going in the right direction um, but um, if I can avoid being murdered by my friends next to me um, when you look at the way we have to do that um, you know it relies very heavily um, on what governments are saying um, and it's it's very intensive to actually unpack that and this is something that the climate action tracker is looking to deepen and and do better with because we uh, understand and a number of important cases that the current policy projections of governments may not be really where their emissions are headed. So the evaluation of potential progress is, you know, it, it, in some sense a question because uh, we in the scientific community haven't got the capacity to actually get to the bottom of those questions. And, and we know we're getting questions from private sector entities looking at this as well. We know that's of interest in some quarters. Hello, everyone. Thank you. My name is Todd Fernandez. I'm an advisor to Food and Water Watch and 350 NYC. And I wanted to let people know about the Off Fossil Fuels Act, a new piece of federal legislation filed by Representative Gabbard of Hawaii um, to mandate 100% renewables nationwide in the United States by 2035. It has 45 co sponsors and dozens of more candidates pledged to support it. We hope to have 100 co-sponsors when we refile next year. Um, it works with a mechanism of mandating that all the electric companies nationwide procure exclusively 100% renewable. So it's a fascinating market-driven um, solution to outlaw pollution categorically. Um, so I, my question, though, um, is twofold. What can we do? Um, to get the word out more about the fact that there is now a federal solution. But more importantly, when we started looking into this movement, 2015 Paris did a great thing setting a two degree goal. But the more I studied it, it seemed like we had about 20 years to get to, uh, to change our world economy radically in order to actually achieve that. But nobody knows this. I don't think anyone knows this outside the environmental movement and within it. Very few people are really uh, aware that there's such a limited window of opportunity. Um, so what can we do about spreading that word and that alarm? Because I think without it, there will not be a sense of urgency adequate to force public policy to advance fast enough. So uh, that's the question. And am I right about that? Is it 20 years more pollution before we are locked in to exceeding two degrees uh, global warming? Thank you. Thanks very much. Bill, you want to speak to the question? Yeah, look, it's not 20. We've got two years to peak emissions. That's absolutely clear, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, but look, um, on, the, on the question of getting the word out, I think that um, I, I wouldn't be as pessimistic as you are in that context because, uh, as Nicholas's work has shown, um, there is a lot of, um, let's say, non state actors, cities, uh, sub-nationals, um, companies that are taking action uh, are not just in the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that there is a broad awareness of climate change growing around the world. Um, and I, I think that countries that um, until recent times had a very little uh, level of awareness at the population level are showing increasing signs of concern and populations are talking to governments about the problems that they're getting um, as a consequence of climate change. So I think that's, one can always do more, but I think that there's a general level of understanding about that. And we can also see that in the reaction to the Trump withdrawal uh, uh, from the Paris Agreement. I don't know what exactly the Trump administration expected, but I'm sure it wasn't what happened. What happened was that the, you know, the Paris Agreement did not implode, it did not deflate. In fact, in some senses, we've seen a re-energisation of 
action, not everywhere, not in all times, but in general, the whole process is kept together. So I, I think that has been a very strong uh, development as well. On the 20 year argument, this is about, um, I, I guess it's linked to the carbon budget issue that, yes, we've only got about 560 gigatons or 650 gigatons, depends whose budget you believe, um, to actually keep within uh, the one and a half degree limit, for example, which might only be 15 or 25 years emissions. But the point there is that uh, this kind of budget actually um, for these kind of low level low uh, temperature targets is not really suitable for purpose. It's, a, it's an interesting arithmetic and didactic tool, but to actually get to one and a half degrees, we need to look at the whole stream of emissions over the next 60 to 80 years. And here there's positive emissions for the first several decades, and there must be negative emissions later. And the net effect is your budget, if that makes any sense at, at all as a budget. And right now, the, the major policy task we've got is to get emissions down to zero as fast as we can and simply minimise the need for negative emissions later. So in, in that way, we have not just a 20-year project, but a, a, at least a 50- or 60-year project to, to bring about that transformation. But the most important step, I made a joke about two years, but the most important step is actually to get these global emissions to peak. Uh, once that happens, then I think we will see virtual cycles begin to unfold as technology starts to get cheaper and governments start to see the benefits of that quickly. Okay. Optimistic, the recent reductions in renewable clean vehicle technologies, etc., storage technologies, and then you did the four countries or regions, which was a bit more mixed. Um, and I'm wondering what assumptions you made about the continuation of those technology cost reduction trends in those sectors, because it looked like your analysis was based for the countries, was based most on sort of stated or, or possible policy uh, at both the national and subnational level. And as we know, if those technology trends continue at some point, the market economics sort of overwhelm policy and you get a self-sustaining positive feedback where, you know, you hit peak oil and then all of a sudden, EV really accelerates on an upward curve and you could really do a lot more than you showed there. I'm wondering if, if some of the regional or, or national things might be a little more pessimistic than, uh, than might be implied by those technology curves. And then the second question would be, we saw a whole slew of announcements uh, two weeks ago in California at the Global Climate Action Summit, including some commitments by major multinational institutions, banks, insurance companies, et cetera, to shift uh, investments to adopt science-based targets. Uh, could that also have a, a snowballing effect that might affect the trends in countries like China or India, even without additional policy action at the national level? Okay. Yeah, on the, on the technology level, uh, um, like a, a runaway effect is not in there yet. What we do is we update it each year uh, what the new perspective is. And there each year we see that global, our global estimate of what would happen under current policies, no matter whether they're more or less policies, is going down because of this technological development. So we see that and the first time we, it was so big from one year to the next that we saw an impact on greenhouse, uh, on temperature by the end of the century. From one year to the next. That has never happened before in the 10 years where we did it. So it's really accelerating and it's in there but being updated year to year. Next one is the, yeah, the new commitments from the Global Climate Action Summit. Well, the, the report we did was before, so not in there yet. An update to come. It's definitely more. Uh, it's very, very encouraging. And what we want to look at the next thing is to have to look more at this catalytic effect. Because if one company does it or two do it, then, well, they may have difficulties. But if half of the companies do it, then it becomes the mainstream and it will flip certain things to happen. And that's something that we all uh, look into the future. It hopefully happens, but we still have to analyze it more. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, we're actively uh, researching uh, where these technology tipping points might be um, in, in different ways. But the other point to remember is that um, what's politely called political economy plays a very fundamental role um, in a number of countries. So even where you have renewable energy costs uh, dropping below, uh, e even the cost of um, the marginal production of existing coal plant, let alone new coal plant, um, you will see governments continue to maintain support for coal, for example, um, and, and at scale. Um, in other words, it's not economically rational, 
It's about defending interests or perceived interests, um, and and that that will emerge, I think, out of the noise in the next few years as one of the dominant problems. Actually, once you see the technology price effects get to a certain point, then you will see political economy issues become uh, more and more problematic. Um, and um, we've alluded to countries in Southeast Asia. We've got Turkey. We've got Egypt. We've got countries like this, which are clearly making investments which probably don't stack up from an economically rational point of view. Um, and I think we will start to see more of those issues emerge um, where price is no longer the problem. It's actually government backing and the constellation of issues we referred to earlier with, say, some developed countries continuing to support this technology along with some uh, Chinese interests also until the Chinese government begins to see that this doesn't make sense because China also wants to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. I mean, it seems like you're seeing a difference there between the U.S. and China, where Trump is trying to do that but not failing because the subnational and the market forces, China is being more effective than using the political economy to blunt what should be happening in the market forces. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced the Chinese government is doing it. I didn't say that. I think that's a very important distinction. Um, you know, we know in the past OECD governments never really properly brought their you know, export-import banks under control, and a lot of dirty technology in different domains was exported, you know, basically without adult attention being paid. So that I, I suspect at present that's also the dynamic in China, that um, it's a big country, um, it's complicated, um, it's not got a dictator yet, um, and I think that um, it's likely that simply enterprises are going off and doing what they can to keep their business going. Um, and I think that ultimately, the Chinese government will have to look at that because it, it does contradict the longer-term strategic issues in the same way that OECD countries came round to understand that after you know, not, not one but several attempts that to, to bring this sort of um, fossil-intensive investment backing under control. Okay, um, I take all the final questions, so just take a note because we're at the end of our allotted time, so we'll Thank take your you. question. I think you wanted the floor also. Okay. okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Hyden with a Partnership for Policy Integrity. And my question is uh, a lot of the, if not many, if not most of the models for getting to 1.5 uh, rely on, on BECS, bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. Um, the, the concerns my organization has about biomass energy is it's a, it's a triple threat, right? You have the, uh, the impact of the emissions when you burn the wood, you have the impact of the, the loss of, of forests uh, that sequester the carbon, and then you also have, because a lot of renewable energy policies um, uh, subsidize the biomass energy, you actually have a loss of funding that could be going to clean renewable energy sources, uh, such as wind and solar. And um, because we're going brief, I won't go into more detail than that, but I want to find out if this is an issue that uh, you've explored and analyzed. Uh, because part of the problem is the IPCC uh, analysis has a loophole and they're not properly counting the carbon emissions. So for many people, there's an ad ad advantage of saying, look, our emissions are going down, but they're not counting uh, these emissions, which can be significant um, through the life cycle of the production of biomass energy. Uh, could one of you speak to that, please? Okay, thanks very much. Just with a question. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, building, on Thank you. building on that question, uh, more broadly, how do we deal with this massive gap in data and policy initiatives associated with the land sector? Uh, that's only one subset of this broader challenge. Okay, thanks very much. Are there any other requests for the floor? Okay, any comments? Then? Yeah. Um, on the question of uh, negative emissions and, and VEX, um, now the first thing to say is it's, it's not the IPCC's fault. So I, I don't. I just reject that sort of usage of language because the IPCC is assessing um, what uh, individual modelling groups are doing. So it's, you know, if you want to tackle the problem, see it that way. Um, the bioenergy issue is a concern to, to many, um, uh, and of course, it's not restricted to one and a half degree pathways. 
because if you look at the energy scenarios available to us from the scientific community, they have very similar levels of bioenergy, whether they hit four degrees or one and a half degrees, right? So there's a baseline issue to deal with anyway, which would have similar consequences. Um, I, I think I haven't polled our colleagues here, but I, I don't think any of us really believe the, the, the massive scale effects that you see in the models, um, and uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, and instead, we would foresee that for negative emissions, there will be a portfolio of technologies deployed. And different specs will be deployed. Um, it, it is going to be useful in a number of contexts. The scale um, in, in the models. There are other technologies that take CO2 out of the air, such as direct air capture, which may, may, de may be deployed at, at significant, if not larger scale, ultimately. Um, that won't be without. Uh, environmental challenges either because you've got to store the carbon somewhere. On the question of does the IPCC accounting system close the, um, the emissions around bioenergy, yes it does. Um, it's simply a fact that it does. Um, and I think that has to be understood if you're going to fix the system because the system's not about whether the IPCC accounting system closes it. It's ultimately about are, are, are bioenergy fuels being exported or imported into places that have asymmetric accounting? That's something that has to be fixed. And are governments reporting on the question of the land sector properly? Because if they're not, in principle, you will miss not just bioenergy, but a whole lot of other dreadful practices. And I think this is an issue which also governments have worked diligently the adoption of reporting rules that would be completely watertight. Yeah, I, nothing to add on this. I think you covered it well. just add one more thing there. Uh, you're right about the import export as being part of the issue of the IPCC analysis, but you also, the federal government, the U.S. government, both Congress and EPA, declaring that forest biomass energy is carbon neutral. That's not science based, that's just a fiat. And it's, it, if you use real uh, science based policy, that's not where you would arrive at. So it's a big issue. I, I look forward to further discussion. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the first part of our discussion this evening on global climate action, where it's at. Um, I'd like to ask you to give a round of applause to our presenters. <laughs> I think they provided quite a lot of food for thought, and they really set up very nicely the second part, which we will do after the coffee break. So let's take a short 10-minute coffee break. It's now quarter to, to three by my clock, so we'll come back at five to three, and then we'll get into the second part as to how can we drive politically, how can we drive this process to increase ambition. And we have a new panel, a very diverse panel, a very knowledgeable panel, which I'm sure you're going to enjoy. So 10 minutes, and then we'll be back.
Yeah, it was a very good discussion, but I think we have some people who have some tight deadlines working with. Thank you. section is to talk about the political processes that need to align to help us to improve our ambition of our emission reductions. Because as you have seen in the previous presentation, there is quite a bit going on in a number of different countries. But the problem so the question really is, how do we get the rapid reductions we need by 2030 if we have to keep within the possibility of achieving our 1.5 target. And in this respect, 2020 is a critical year because it provides the next opportunity for government and politicians to step up to the plate to say what it is they're going to be doing. You will recall in 2020 under the Paris Agreement, it's the date for announcing your new or updated indices, and it's also the date for countries to submit their low greenhouse gas emission development strategy. So the question really is, how can we get countries to take these opportunities seriously and announce the scale of NBCs and the scale of emission cuts that we really, we really need to see? There are a lot of different players in the game right now. We have the non-state actors just finished the summit in California and then with a pledge to do further action. In the UN and process, we have the Telenor Dialogue, which will be coming up at the COP in the next couple of months. We have the One Planet Summit, President Macron, which is going on right now, in fact, at another venue here in New York. Next year, we have the High Level Political Forum on Climate Change and the SDGs um, and the UN. And then we also have the UN Secretary General at the Climate Summit in 2019. And all of these will be informed by the new IPCC special report on 1.5, which will tell us what the pathways which we need to get to should look like. So, so, so the question is really, how can we get all these different elements to work together? How do we get them to be synergistic? How can we get them to respond to the science? And then are there other processes that's happening that we need to pull together also so that we ensure that rather than individuals working in silos, we really get to the point of having a global wave, if you want to call it, which will generate the emissions reductions which we're looking for. Um, and translate into increased ambition in the new realm of, of NDCs for 2030. Um, is there a role for a global head of government movement in 2020, for example? similar to what we had at Paris when we had all the heads come together at the start of the Paris Agreement, the Paris negotiations in Paris. So these are all the kinds of things we need to start thinking through. And we brought together a very diverse competitive panel, which hopefully can share some initial thoughts with us, and then we'll open for a general discussion with you on, on the subjects. Our first speaker on the panel would be Her Excellency Ambassador Janine Coy Felsen, who is the Deputy Representative of Belize to the United Nations and who's a very active climate negotiator, very involved in the climate finance issues. Then, alongside her, 
We have Andrea Guerrero from Colombia, who was also heavily involved in climate issues and was a, a negotiator for many years. She has a long trajectory in the United Nations from a convention on climate change. And I was actually a member of the UN Electricity Bureau when she was part of the, of the process. Then next to her, we have Mr. Manjit Dakal, who is the head of support for climate analytics and an advisor to the LDC chair. And last but not least, we have Mr. Grabert. Mr. James Grabert, who is the Director of Sustainable Development Mechanisms in the UNFCCC Secretariat and works a lot on the link between sustainable development and climate change and the UNFCCC process. So we have people from the small island states, the LDCs, ILAC, and then from the UNFCCC mechanism who will share those thoughts with us. So let me without ado introduce our first speaker, Ambassador Felsen. Uh, she'll share her thoughts. We've given her up to five minutes to share with you. And then we'll take each of the speakers individually, and then we'll open for feedback, discussions, questions, and so on. Ambassador Felsen. Thank you very much, Leon, and thank you to Climate Analytics for inviting me to share some views um, in respect of how exactly we will move towards bending the curve. And I say move towards because I think this is a, a process. It doesn't happen overnight. I wish it would. Um, I think the small island developing states since uh, 2009 have been calling for ambitious action towards 1.5 degrees, and we only attained it in Paris in 2015. Um, and what this evidences is the need for consistent leadership. Um, with the Paris Agreement, what we attained was the um, acknowledgement that that leadership doesn't always have to be from the top. It can be from the bottom. It can be from many different areas. Um, it doesn't have to be government. It doesn't have to be uh, an organization. It can be people, um, communities acting together towards a common goal. Um, so that's one point I think that we need to emphasize when we're thinking about how we achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement is in fact leadership. Um, I also want to underscore having the background of, of being in the political negotiation for some time now, um, the importance that we don't need to invest political leadership in one country. Um, there are leaders uh, who are very evidently um, willing to come forward. Um, those leaders can be from small island developing states, it can be, they can be from the least developed countries. Um, what we need is a diversity of uh, leadership that we can draw on to ensure that there's consistency in messaging as we move towards the 1.5 degree. A second aspect that I think we absolutely need to start focusing our energies on um, is to create a platform for continuous political dialogue, um, dialogue period, not even political between the development communities and the climate change communities. Um, Belize has, uh, together with uh, climate analytics and other um, support uh, groups, been, uh, we've been looking at how we can break the silos, how we can start that conversation here in New York. Um, we've held two events to look at uh, how 1.5, why 1.5 degrees matters to sustainable development goals. Um, we've looked also at how loss and damage can impact um, our sustainable development objectives. And I think that type of conversation needs to be systematized in New York, because this is where we're actually dealing with sustainable development goals. The 2030 Agenda was a major turning point in our development exercise. Um, it, it advocates for an integrated approach across many different areas, and I think we need to optimize that approach to our advantage towards breaking down the silos, converging global agendas, and looking towards a way in which we can, through this integrated approach, uh, advocate for advocate for a um, carbon neutral or a zero carbon development. Um, this is very critical because I think this is one of the stumbling blocks we often find. And linking that back to leadership, 
we can see through various um, uh, uh, global agendas, we can try to identify a way in which we can cross-fertilize ideas um, through leaders in trying to break into uh, or converge in these various global agendas. I think we have several opportunities at Ham already. Um, the high-level political forum, which will have as one of its areas of focus um, climate change. Um, we have the Secretary General Summit, and just at the end of this year, we do have the Talanoa Dialogue. Uh, so I think we have an opportunity to start that um, dialogue and to try to sustain it through um, 2020, when we hope to have updated nationally determined contributions. Um, one final point, and I think this, is, this goes without saying, is that we need to match our words with action. We need to ensure that we have the necessary means of implementation to support action towards these ambitious development strategies, um, which will take into account the Paris goals. Um, they're important. Um, and we also have, in the context of the upcoming Climate Change Conference, a, a discussion that will revolve around the replenishment process for the Green Climate Fund. Now, mindful that the Green Climate Fund does have, a have its challenges, um, uh, that aside, it still remains one of the primary channels under the convention um, that is to be used for purposes of advancing climate action. And I think a major signal um, and an important signal to be had from uh, at, at COP24 is a more robust, a robust, robust replenishment process. So I think these three points, um, I'll leave it at that, Leon, and I'm happy to engage. I think we should have an interactive discussion. Being in the political realm, um, I know that many of you come from uh, very diverse backgrounds, and I think it would be useful to hear your own ideas on, on, on these issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador Felsen. And just on a bit of, in, so just so we all we all are aware of the range of what we, we do now, the scope it's addressing. Okay, our next speaker is Andrea Guerrero. And um, I omitted one point in the initial introduction that she's a senior advisor to Mission 2020. 20, yeah, 2020. So, Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. And, and thank you very much to Climate Analytics for the invitation. It's, it's very nice for me to say, see uh, old friends again from the negotiations and from the scientific community that support all our work. Um, I was asked to tell you a bit about the Global Climate Action Summit, what happened, uh, and I'd like to link this to the, the point that the ambassador made about how this connects into the Paris Agreement, the greater process, uh, how this, the, this was enabled by the Paris Agreement as an acknowledgement that leadership doesn't have to come from the top, which I, I really like the way she phrased it. So. Um, for those of you who don't know Mission 2020, it's an organization that is pursuing a message of climate action, urgent climate action for the 2020 moment. It's led by Cristiana Figueres, who was a secretary, uh, executive secretary for the UNFCCC. And uh, the GCAS story, the summit story, starts with her uh, right after Paris. I think it was the next day or in the next few days after Paris. Uh, she started getting very concerned about um, us having created the right vehicle for uh, ambition and for the changes that the atmosphere needs to see, but um, the fuel was not enough. And we all knew this and we all know this, uh, the fuel being the pledges, the NDCs, uh, the pledges from other actors, were not adding up to what we needed. Uh, and this group was, is one of the ones that reminded us from the beginning that that was the case. Uh, and I hope you keep doing that um, until we make it. So with that, she, one, founded uh, this idea of Mission 2020, and two, called uh, Governor Brown and Mike Bloom Bloomberg and told them we need something to inject that other side as well to just visualize what uh, the other actors, the non-state actors, can do and will do and are doing. So with that, um, the conversation started, uh, and that's why Mission 2020 got involved, and we helped uh, with the Californian team to shape these commitments that we saw two weeks ago. Um, and so we've been working on that for about a year. And uh, last week, we saw 
more than 4,000 people that were official delegates. Uh, we had 25 sessions. We had um, more than 325 affiliate events, so events that happened outside of DICAs that, that we didn't plan for or we just gave them official recognition, but they, they spurred from um, the different actors and these were hosted by companies, civil society, we had events on uh, land, on jo a job transition, on anything you can think of uh, that was happening last uh, two weeks ago in, in California. We had more than 500 major commitments in five challenge areas. For those of you that didn't follow uh, GECAS too much, we had one challenge area on healthy energy systems, another one on inclusive econo economic growth, uh, third on sustainable communities, the fourth was lands and oceans, and the fifth was transformative climate investment. So uh, under those five broad, broad areas, we had, again, more than 500 commitments. I'm not going to get into specific numbers because it's like nine slides worth of information that I can give to anyone that is interested in reading them, but they're also available online in the GCAS website. We had commitments, so you get an idea on uh, zero emission vehicles. We also had uh, commi uh, commitments under EV100, RE100, we had the Step Up Declaration, which is uh, a declaration that many tech, tech communities, uh, a lot from San Francisco and, and the Bay Area, but from other places as well, pledging to use that te technology to help other sectors also um, get closer to carbon neutrality by 2050. We had more than 70 big cities uh, pledging to be carbon neutral by 2050. 9,100 cities with carbon action plans are pledging to have uh, carbon action plans, um, pledges around zero waste, uh, buildings with carbon neutrality or reduced carbon footprint. We had pledges around the food and forest issues, including supply chains with major international com corporations pledging to reduce their emissions from those sources as well. Uh, and we had a lot of commitments around the financial sector in terms of climate investment, um, uh, percentages of their portfolio going towards climate investments, et cetera. Uh, all of these are packaged under the call to action. So if you look online, you'll have a call to action, which uh, just tells the world what the general sentiment of these actors was. Uh, it, ha it will have some annexes that there are, we're finishing the numbers on, but it will have annexes on each of the challenge areas with the specific uh, commitments. And at the end, it calls on national governments to facilitate, enable, and their work in, car in climate and also to increase their ambition. And I think that's um, the interesting point to discuss here is how are we going to take all this movement and really see it in the ambition of these countries and in the revision that should be starting this year or early next year because these processes take time within countries so we can deliver at the 2020 moment. So um, I think that's what, what we need, the next step, that's what we all collectively need to figure out is how can we do this? There's a technical question of it, of trying to decipher out of all the commitments um, what that means for each particular country and how that can encourage them to go further in their ambition. But politically, and, and maybe most importantly, how do we really translate that message into um, messages for countries that tell them it's okay, okay to go further, you are not, you know, it's not only in your hands, your cities, your regions, your companies are acting and are willing to act. So that, how do we do that, how do we make that link is something that we're currently um, thinking through and discussing with the Secretary General's team so we can think through it uh, using the 2019 summit moment. Uh, and, and that's our collective challenge, I think. And that there's also room, of course, for help from analytical groups uh, like Climate Works and, and others that are here to help us deliver that message um, to countries that might be reluctant to, to address their, their climate ambition um, and that revision process that needs to start. How do we get this message specifically to them so, so they feel encouraged to, to raise their ambition? But in general, we're very happy with the results of GICAS. I think all of us always want more. <laughs> so our, our dream targets uh, could have been higher, but we, we think that there was a very robust show of, for, of force of all the non-state state actors that were with us. 
and uh, we're just looking forward to using that, um, those vehicles we created to deliver that and that momentum towards the 2019 and especially the 2020 moment. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew, and congratulations on a successful summit. Um, our next speaker, Manjit, is going to provide us with a perspective from the least developed countries. Manjit. Um, thank you, thank you, Leon. Uh, let me start uh, briefly with the with the context of, of the least developed countries. Uh, these are the, the 47 group of countries uh, across Africa, uh, Asia, and Latin America, with with the diverse uh, diversely uh, scattered in, in, in the different geography. Uh, with 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 the with the strong uh, with with the difficult and the capacity constraint as well as the, the the difficult economy back home. These are some of the countries who are taking ambitious action on climate change. Uh, ranging from the, uh, the the preservation of the forest uh, up to up to like 70 percent that some of the countries have that uh, inscribed in their in their constitution. Uh, some of the countries even have a unconditional uh, emission reduction target. Uh, the, the, some of the countries are part of 100 percent renewable energy uh, the initiative. So so despite of all these limitations, con uh, the, the countries are also taking action. So we believe on on uh, leading by examples uh, uh, so that uh, so that it's not only uh, about the economy but also to, to, to think about the survival uh, and, and where the, the example has to be set so so coming from this context uh, uh, the, the 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 discussion around the 1.5 degree and the way the, the the negotiations are leading towards cop 24 I think it's, it's, it's a very crucial moment uh, the way the, the discussions are going around. Uh, let me start uh, very specifically with the uh, with the process related to Talanoa dialogue. Uh, the recently the, the the LDC group made a submission uh, on the Talanoa dialogue. There is a discussion going on around, about uh, about the about the declaration or, or some kind of uh, the the declaration to be launched uh, at, at, at COP24. We strongly believe that uh, there should be a, a concrete uh, a process uh, to be. And, and, and the decision to be made at COP24. So we provided the elements uh, for COP24, uh, how the decision can be framed, uh, because we believe that for the government to come up with the next round of NDC uh, is the decision that will help to, to inject the process at the national level, uh, if, uh, then, then compared with the declaration. Uh, so uh, we, we, we see this process very, very, uh, as, as, an, as a very important uh, landmark that helps country to come up with the next round of N NDC where the, where the, where the ambition uh, has to be raised. Uh, and, and, and in this context, uh, the, the Secretary General Summit in, in 2019, uh, this was one of the proposals made by the LDC group in, in, in May 2017 uh, in, in, during, the, during the UNFCC session, and, and, we, and we are pleased that this has been taken uh, up in the process, uh, and, and the summit will be there. Uh, and, and, and we see this, uh, the, the Secretary General Summit, as one of the important landmarks where all these events, uh, the, the, the events around Mission 2020, uh, the, 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 the initiatives that the government has been taking, uh, and, and, the, and the, the initiative that the business community and the civil society has been taking, uh, I think uh, we, we believe that, that, that uh, the, the Secretary General Summit will be the one that, that provides a kind of umbrella that helps everyone, every, every initiatives to, to, to get together uh, so that uh, so that the, the ambition can be raised, raised and then uh, we, we, we go towards uh, achieving uh, the 1.5 degree target uh, because uh, the it, it's, it's not only about the matter of the negotiation uh, when we dis when, when, when we are uh, at the negotiation process for the 1.5 degree because it's, it's, it's also linked with the survival of our people uh, is our is our, as I was giving example earlier, uh, it, it may it may sound uh, very low in terms of percentage of emission reduction or in, in terms of percentage of the economy when the, the initiatives by any least developed countries uh, are, are put forwarded but but if we if we compare with the uh, but when we see from the uh, from the impact side uh, when there are any impact uh, at, at the country level and if we, if we put it in a percentage uh, it's, 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 it's really bigger uh, in terms of the number, it may be low, but in terms of the percentage uh, that the economy is impacted at, at the country level, uh, that, that, that really count, that really has, has a bigger impact at the country level. Uh, so, but, but despite of all these challenges, countries are taking action, initiatives, uh, and uh, it's not only about the matter of the negotiation, but, but, but all this discussion has to be reached to the, to the, to the, to the to certain level uh, so that the, 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 the implementation uh, uh, gets uh, 
gets uh, processed further so that uh, the, the, the poor community at, at the countries uh, are are at the stage where uh, where uh, they can they can they can have a, a, a a situation where the where the climate impacts can be uh, can be easily handled. So, so 1.5 degree is, is not only the matter of negotiation, but we see it from the survival perspective. Uh, and 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 just to conclude, uh, the the Secretary General Summit in 2019 is is one of the one of the landmark that that we have been uh, that suggesting which helps uh, all this uh, the discussion, all this dialogue, all these initiatives to come together uh, that helps to raise ambition. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Manjit. And then our fourth speaker, Mr. James Gabbard from the UNFCCC Secretariat. Thank you. If you allow me, then I'll answer the question, what needs to come together in the UNFCCC process to ensure ambitious climate change happens? Um, there are two elements. Um, the first one you may think, perhaps, why is this so important? But this is what's happening in Katowice. This is what we refer to as, you know, we need to put in place the operational manual. We need to put in place the work program for delivering on the Paris Agreement. While it's about how we deliver and how we operationalize things, it's also really important for ambition. And the reason so, um, so succeeding at this is important. And let me say, I think we are, we have a pathway to succeed. It's going to be still very difficult. It's, it's, no, it's not guaranteed. Um, but all the countries are working very hard. The Secretary is working hard to support these negotiations so we can arrive at the end of Katowice with the, the work program agreed. Um, but the reason I want to say this is important for the issue of um, greater ambition is because it gives a signal. It, 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 it's also a signal. It's a signal that these countries have reaffirmed their commitment to what Paris has asked them to do. They've reaffirmed as well their ability and, and willingness to work together and to cooperate. Let's not forget the Paris Agreement. One of the key principles is cooperation, cooperative efforts. Everyone's in, everyone's involved. Um, so that's that, I would say, is the first element in our process that can help us get towards just this drive for greater ambition over the next couple of years that we're looking for. The second one is more about the actual process, where you wouldn't be surprised. And there we, uh, I would say there are three pillars that we need to see happening in 2019 and, th and, and 2020. Um, the first one is obviously um, enhanced NDCs or uh, indication announcements of what the process is going to be for that. Um, um, that's very important. Um, again, if we don't have those enhanced NDCs coming forward, hopefully <coughs> faster than required, um, yeah, we will not be on a path probably to the greater ambition that at least those of us in this room are, are hoping will, will, will happen. Um, the second pillar is the long-term strategies. Let's not forget those are also due to be submitted, and we have a, a handful of countries who have done that, and, um, but not everyone has done it, and um, this is obviously not an easy process to look long-term uh, at a national level of how you're going to deliver um, on, on climate change, and I'll come to later how this also has to be integrated across many other things, and, and broad use the term sustainable development here. Um, it's quite a difficult um, exercise, but it's also very important that this comes together in the next couple of years. That said, we um, do know already that some countries are coming forward. We've heard from the Marshall Islands that they do intend you know, to have an enhanced NDC. Um, this morning I heard from the Fijian Prime Minister an intent to, to also announce towards the end of the year their intentions about this NDC and, and, and enhancement. And, so things are moving forward, that's good. Uh, we need more of that, and I think some of the colleagues here mentioned the, the various milestones, events, so I won't mention that, but those have to be the moments where we are constantly, I think, you know, nudging governments to step up and find the, the, the moment to, to you know, and make these announcements and, and, and understand how it's important also to keep the momentum going, um, but really key to, you know, drive the, drive the, the am ambition. To use the word signal again, because these are the signals, um, the NDCs, um, and in the long-term strategies, uh, I also work in the area of carbon markets, and we often talk about signals. Well, without signals, it's very hard to get the real economy to uh, to respond. So these NDCs and long-term strategies also play a key role in linking with the climate action space, the real, the, the real economy space, et cetera. Um, the third part, uh, a third pillar of this, this, this uh, area where we need to move in our process is, is the climate action part of this process. Um, as you know, the UNFCC, is involved. We um, play a role kind of as a, a, a bridge or a, a conduit between the non-state actors and the parties trying to do our best to communicate to the parties what's happening, um, 
what's working, what's not working, what are the policy levers. Uh, we do this through various things like our annual reports or our NASCA platform, which, which many of these commitments that were mentioned are going to be uh, available on. Um, so we do these activities. We also participate in and drive um, the the gathering and convening of activities where, there, where, there's a, where there's a need for that across the various uh, spaces. But what's more important, I would say even more so in our process is, is, is and again, broadly in the UNSCC process, not something my secretary personally can, can, can do, but is that the community, the climate action community, I mean the business, investors, civil society, everyone, works on the tools and the evidence and puts the teeth behind what needs to be done and, and really shows how this is working. And this is what these events and what all these reports and all this effort to be more consistent and some of the things you talked about earlier today where we're trying to look at how do we add these things up are so important because it really gives the messages to, to the parties about what's possible. But I find that there's still the elements of greater collaboration needed, um, a vertical integration more in terms of what's happening in the non-state space and the national space. Um, yeah, so that parties can develop appropriate um, policies and appropriate institutional arrangements that then allow them actually to complete, again, those long-term strategies that really are cross-sectoral, um, cross, you know, really, can really um, cover the whole SDG space. Um, and then finally, within that climate action space in our process, I think in something I see happening more and more in the various uh, activities is is talk across sectors, talk across initiatives, talk across coalitions. Um, there's so much potential there that still isn't discovered, I believe. Maybe I'll just stop at that. But those are the kind of things I see when this happen in the broader UNSCC process. Okay, thanks very much. And as I promised, a very diversified range of opinions and ideas. I'd like to indulge you in one request. Um, Andrea has to leave us in about five minutes. So I want to ask anybody who has specific questions for her on the Global Climate Action Summit. Let's take those questions first, and then we'll open up for other broader general questions following this. Question. And I, I just take all the questions first. Andrea will note them, and then she can make one response. Great. I thought the Global Climate Summit was great. A lot of the I was at a lot of the different events. It was a wonderful overview of what's possible at local level and, and examples of what can be done. Um, but I still am yearning to hear the collective vision of what we actually need to do. And, you know, I hear a lot of conversations. So, and what's missing from the dialogue, I think, uh, we talk a lot about climate science, political science. Um, and I'm a legislative director in state government previously, but I've also worked in the LGBT rights movement internationally and domestically. And I work with the grassroots organizations of the climate movement, which has yet to solidify around um, demands like the All Fossil Fuels Act I mentioned as just one example of a possibility but um, I would love to see more conversation of the political science what are the forces at work in the, in the grassroots and, and grass tops and in the movement essentially that can be brought to bear in a more constructive and unified way to bring the political pressure that's necessary to see actual public policy legal changes to bring us where we need to go. Because right now we're just, it seems like we're dealing with pieces instead of the whole, even on a state level like the United States. Um, and even talking about carbon pricing, it seems like we're playing around in the gray middle zone when we really need to stop that and start saying, no, we need to outlaw pollution. We need to mandate 100% renewables by date certain, whatever that looks like. And so that's the general, and I would be interested actually in helping to facilitate putting together a political science conversation um, going forward. Okay, thanks very much. Any additional questions for Andrea? Specific to the Global Climate Action Summit or the work of Mission 2020? Sure. Okay, if no direct questions, Andrea, do you want to respond? Sure, um, and thank you, and thank you for, for participating. I. I do agree with you. I, I think the political science is, is missing and needs to be taken to, to country level, perhaps, uh, where things look very different in every, in every single country, uh, right? So the, the, the different pressure points that you have to apply are different in the, in the, in the local context. So we've seen uh, in our working countries that um, 
organizing around things like health and, um, and, and, and air quality are very effective in some places, very ineffective, unfortunately, in others because they, they, it just doesn't, doesn't work. In other places, you need to organize businesses to be the, the, your voice, to be the voice that speaks to government, and then you get reactions, and then you get doors opening that, that don't open for every other actor type, unfortunately, but being very real, that's, that's what you find. Um, in some others, there's the public rallies, like the numbers of people are very important. In others, no. So I think what we need to start figuring out is where we work, where each of you and, and we work, what are those pressure points that work and try to organize around those. Uh, and, and that's something that we're seeing to an extent, but I think can be built upon a lot more. And you see a lot of coordination of actors that we weren't seeing before. So I, I would encourage those those groups to come together to be analytical and strategic about where to push and not try like everything in, at once with little smaller groups, but try to unite in the big levers that will work in each circumstance. And that might look very different in Colombia, where I'm from, than in uh, Korea, where you know other other voices might be more listened to. So that's, that, you have a, a great point, and I think you, you answered your own question, and that's what we need to do is organize uh, and be strong. Very similar point, and that's our executive secretary talks about um, inclusive multilateralism, meaning everyone has to be at the table, and it's, it's not just the national government, it's the civil society, the business, the corporations, the cities. And this is because Paris is not top-down, like Kyoto was, and although you were pointing out that sometimes some top-down things can help move, <laughs> Um, it's bottom-up. Bottom-up doesn't mean, though, at the national level. Bottom-up really needs to mean it at, at, at all levels. That's why she pushes this issue of uh, inclusive multilateralism. So I, maybe using that you know, to push the issue and say that's what Paris is asking for, and that's what we all have to do. Um, anyways. Okay, thanks very much. Create platforms and yeah. conversations that really bring the activists to the table um, and show that they're part of the solution they have Okay, so I'd like to now open the floor for any questions you have to the other panelists and also whether or not you have any suggestions in terms of how we can bring all of this together. Let me ask, say thank you very much to Andrew. I know she has a very specific answer. So, Andrea, thanks very much and we look forward to working with you again Thanks. in the next few weeks and months. Okay, so general questions and suggestions as to how can we ensure that everything comes together to work synergistically. Um, Hi. You start identify your organization so we yeah. know who you are and then we'll take the question. Yeah. Hi there, it's Mark Chadwick from EcoAct. I'm interested in the way that the policies are likely to come together with respect to tradable instruments and how they could be used to help tr finance the transition. Because it seems to me like a little bit of a tricky area how to make sure we're not double counting on NDCs and, and, and you know, how those policy instruments are going to come together. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we'll take a cluster of questions and then we'll ask the panelists to respond. Um, so any, anybody else has questions for our panelists? Okay, well, while you're thinking, Janine, can I ask it to respond to that last question? I guess you may want to also comment on it. And also the first thing. I, I did miss the last part of your question just because I was um, moving how, across. How can tradable instruments be used to finance the transition? In the context of the discussions that we have been um, engaged in, uh, in, in finance, um, I think there's a lot deeper um, uh, discussion or dialogue that needs to occur around this. Um, we've been sort of hovering on the edges about reporting um, uh, different accounting modalities, which are important, obviously, um, to address those issues. Um, I think in the context of the Green Climate Fund, um, there has to be a lot more discussion that's generated around this. Um, I don't think we've necessarily gotten to these um, points as yet, uh, simply because we're still constructing something that, that um, we hope will be able to be an effective channel for um, resources. Um, but 
in my experience, th this conversation really hasn't been had or hasn't really been dealt with um, in depth, and and I, I think it is a it is a point that needs to to gain a lot more focus, and and hopefully, um, once we come to um, Katowice and we look at the Paris Agreement work program and we finalize that work program, we can in fact take up more substantive issues that will be able to um, help us look at what will be a catalyst to um, financing for the type of climate action, ambitious climate action that we need. Okay, thanks. Very, very quickly, all yeah. the two parts of it, let's say the pure purest issue on trading, so let's say in the context of Article 6, you're talking about Article 6.2. Um, again, the Paris Agreement reads as such that it's clearly about enabling um, the bottom-up possibilities to help meet the needs. It doesn't mean it needs to be, you know, everyone can do anything they want, obviously, and that's why we're having these very intense negotiations. But we have to respect certain principles around environmental integrity, around double counting and the adjustments that are required around the frequency and nature of the reporting so everyone is clear and transparent about what's happened um, because that's really important for trust and that's a very important element of this whole Paris Agreement is the trust that we all have that we're all you know, moving forward in our own way but towards the, towards the actual goal. Um, and it also has to be done, done in a way which is you know, very technical but make sure if we can try to make sure we're not disincentivizing greater ambition. Um, the other elements are the 6.4 and the 6.8, which, you know, 6.4 is going to be a mechanism. Um, questions around how can it be as robust as possible, um, but also, again, oversight, integrity. Um, how do you deal with the, the issue, how it relates to the NDCs, things that are in or out of the NDC. Um, again, not to disincentivize, but also not to not allow the market forces to identify possibilities. So there's all these trade-offs we, we have to address. And then a 6.8, which also crosses in some other areas around technology, finance, but I think that's very important. And it's really fascinating our discussion that we're not just talking about markets, we're talking about non-markets as well. Um, perhaps it's not the words you use, trading instruments, but it's cooperative instruments. It's how are, how are all the parties stepping up really to help each other and to cooperate and ensure, um, not just for the purpose of, of getting a, a, an abatement that can be traded, um, but really to help everyone drive ambition and move the real economy in the right direction. Okay, thanks very much. Taylor? This may appear a bit off topic, but um, can you speak a bit about um, been successful in engaging a broad cross-section of its population to address uh, a ban on uh, offshore oil exploration and also coastal zone planning? Uh, it's an amazing case study. I speak about it in my classes. I'd love to hear firsthand about how that process evolved. Thank you for for the question. Sure. Should I go ahead? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we had a we had an event recently where we brought in um, one of the main proponents for the the ban on oil exploration, which is a, um, a, a nonprofit called Oceana, which you know um, is uh, <laughs> um, in, international. I presume I, I don't know where all their offices are, but certainly Belize, um, and I don't know how wide their global reach is, but it certainly was effective. Um, uh, Oceana um, worked with um, individuals and created a platform using social media and generated an energy around something that Belizeans hold very dear and near to their hearts, and, and that is the reef. Um, we're very proud of the fact that it is the second largest barrier reef in the world. Um, and so when you, I think when you draw on people's passion, you can see results. Um, and it was a tremendous effort. Uh, I witnessed it myself looking at all the social media um, uh, platforms and, and seeing the petitions that were generated from that. Um, and that really, um, once, it, once it reached a certain level, um, the uh, people from Oceana spoke directly with the Prime Minister's office and generated a, a dialogue that then resulted in a discussion on, around the, the ban on um, oil exploration. Um, so that really was an evidence of leadership from the, from the ground up. Um, so that was a very important thing. In terms of our um, coastal um, zone management, um, uh, Belize has been uh, supported by uh, other institutions, other organizations. Um, I, World Wildlife Fund, I know 
what we've been doing to uh, develop evidence-based um, management procedures. Um, uh, during the Ocean Conference here in June of, now I feel like it's been long time, but maybe it was just last year, <laughs> um, we, we invited all our fisher folks and others who are involved in um, coastal zone management in Belize. Um, and what we've developed is basically citizen science. Um, and we're using citizen science to help drive our um, efforts towards um, greater uh, sustainable use of our uh, marine living resources, or marine resources, period. Um, uh, I think what's important is that we've developed a legislative framework that allows for greater ownership of um, fisher folks. They're even involved in the licensing procedures. Um, uh, so and, and and they collect information uh, in the in the process of, of the work that they uh, conduct in their fisheries, um, and use that then to uh, um, provide the basis for um, action that might need to be done. Um, so there again, part of it is you know we've we've had a very um, effective leader um, in our fisheries administrator, um, uh, who's had a vision as well as to how to pull some of these things together. Um, but I think what I would like to emphasize is that the government of Belize has always had a good relationship with the civil society or NGOs um, in the management of resources. So you will see in other areas, um, uh, for instance, um, with respect to our conservation measures, um, uh, forestry, um, we have a co-management both NGOs and government working to manage um, areas. So that, that has developed over the year. We've, we've always had a very strong sense of conservation. It's come up against, of course, development pressures, and that's in every single country. Um, but we still, stand, um, we still stand as a very good example, especially when it comes to um, our fisheries and our coastal zone management, as a good example for other developing countries. Thank you. Including the United States, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any additional thoughts on how can we get the political processes to align to generate more ambitious climate action? Um, James, and I was just wondering if the, if the panel wanted to, to comment on, for example, the Telenor Dialogue. Is there a particular role you see the Telenor Dialogue playing in this overall process? And if you want to comment on the others. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Leon. Uh, I, I think this is a very uh, important process that has been set up uh, as, as, a, as a Talanoa dialogue. Uh, we, uh, I think we all engage actively uh, throughout, the, throughout the year uh, during the preparatory phase uh, and, and, and also there were event organized uh, at, at the regional level, at the national level. Uh, we, we all appreciate the, the, the leadership taken by the Fijian presidency, COP23 presidency, in, in taking this process forward uh, because uh, of it was the, 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 the way the terminology defined the Talanoa as an inclusive, as a storytelling, as, 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 uh, as a kind of no harm to each other, and then uh, trying to take up the process of bringing everyone on board. I think, I think introduction of that process, uh, that concept, really uh, held uh, in, in the UNFCCC process, uh, give a, a, given a, a different uh, angle to, to look at the way the negotiation was going on. Uh, but now I think we are at a very crucial moment uh, uh, the, uh, at, 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 at Katowice, uh, the, the political phase of the Talanoa dialogue uh, will be launched uh, in, in, in presence of the minister. Uh, recently, uh, a few days earlier, uh, there was a paper released by the, by the, pres by the incoming presidency uh, in terms of the organization of the Talanoa dialogue and, and, and how, how the outcome will be and how the process will be taken forward. Uh, there is a mention about, the, about how, the, how the Talanoa dialogue will be organized during COP24, uh, the, 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 pre the presentation of the IPCC 1.5 degree report, uh, and how the, how the outcome, how the outcome will, 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 be, will, be, will come forward in, in a form of declaration. Uh, we, we, we in the LDC group, uh, we, we had a, a brief discussion on this and, and, and in line with the submissions that we have made uh, in the, uh, to the UNFCCC, uh, we, we, we don't uh, feel that that is a strong outcome, that that helps to take the ambition process forward. 
uh, they're, they're, uh, also uh, the also ILAC, uh, EOSIS, uh, the CARICOM countries, and, the, and a few other groups have also made a submission uh, for the Talonova dialogue. How how strong it should be, and and how how it can help uh, to to take the ambition process forward to achieve 1.5 degrees. So so I think we will we will we still have to have a, a few a round of discussion with the incoming presidency how the the outcome can can be framed. But but the story doesn't end only at COP24. Uh, that that's the, that's the, that the decision will be taken, but, but there should be again a movement, again a, again a process set up that helps country to, to raise ambition, uh, that helps to, to, to profile uh, the, 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 the ambition process as well as uh, countries to make com commitment in the, in the, in the raise uh, ambition in the next round of NDC. Uh, and as I, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, the Secretary General Summit next year is, is one of those moments. Uh, also, the, the, the continuity of the mission, uh, the, the, the Global Climate Action Summit uh, agenda, uh, and also the, the other, other political events will be, will be helpful there. But I think that the crucial moment now is at the, the political phase of COP24, uh, where we all have to get together and, and try to have a strong outcome so that it helps country uh, to set up a process to raise ambition. Okay, thanks, Ambassador Ferguson. I would add that we have the special report of 1.5 degrees that the IPCC will be putting out. And I think um, if we're able to, and I hope we are able to, um, use that report as an important input into the Talanoa dialogue, um, we should be able to spotlight the type of ambition that we absolutely need to put our minds to and our political commitment to. Um, so I think um, there's still a planning process uh, that needs to occur <laughs> um, that ensures that we do um, bring right into center, into the center of, of that dialogue, um, the uh, scientific information of what it is um, that we need uh, or that that we need to look at when we're talking about um, achieving 1.5 degree as a long-term temperature goal. Um, and so I think the Talanoa Dialogue really creates um, an environment within which we have the political um, involvement, engagement, um, side by side uh, uh, with a um, very important um, scientific report. And I think bringing those together um, towards an outcome that Manjeet has um, mentioned will be a very critical um, uh, moment. Okay, thanks. Mr. Government? Oh, okay. Well, let me say, as much has been said, so the Talanoa Dialogue, I also agree, it's an excellent, it's, it's reaffirmed the, the role of, like, again, not just the parties, but the non-parties and the scientific community as well, and others in, in, in having a dialogue and understanding the issues. But it's also, I think, we need to make sure that all this, the messages and the findings and, and, and the views that come out carry forward. And there are a number of uh, political moments coming up. One, already next year we'll have, have the high level um, platform on sustainable development where we're actually reviewing the climate action SDG. So that process is a, it's a political process, but it's one that has to be informed by, by facts and, and by action. Um, so hopefully the Talano is also one of those mechanisms where the voices that have been brought together is brought forward. That then leads into the SG summit. And then we also have, when we start looking at how can we share information across the UN process, we have a huge um, CBD event in 2020. And there's a, definitely, you mentioned oceans, but there's the whole bylaw. We really need to start looking at this holistically um, and from the action side as well. So I think there's some really some key political moments and Talano is one of them and one of the earlier ones, but hopefully it carries forward in whatever format or voice is. But. Can I? Can I just um, mention about the high-level political forum um, that, that um, James uh, mentioned? Uh, and and um, our colleague here in the audience uh, referenced the need to, to, in, to ensure that we have a platform for other actors, not just the... ...creates that platform. So the HLPF does allow for participation of uh, the non-state actors. Mm -hmm. And so it would be very interesting to see the level of engagement that we're able to generate for the HLPF in 2019. Um, it's The platform is there, so now we have to seize the platform and use it to, to, to collaborate 
um, with governments um, or, or vice versa with each other um, or governments <coughs> with you um, to, to bring to the attention, to socialize what exactly is happening on the ground um, to support uh, the climate action agenda. But, but also to ensure that, that there is a focus of how all of this matters for all the other sustainable development goals because the 2030 agenda is supposed to be an indivisible agenda. Um, so we need to always keep our eye on, it's not just the climate action or the, the, the climate change issue, it's everything else it has an effect on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I think we've had some very interesting discussion from our panelists. I think what they've indicated is that there's quite a lot of opportunity out there, but there's also quite a lot of work that needs to be done to take advantage of those opportunities. And we seem to have a range of opportunities <coughs> starting with Katowice next month or in December, and then running through 2019 with the High Level Platform and uh, ending with the UNSG Summit. So there seems to be quite a series of events that we can use to try to get the message of increased ambition across over the next 12 months, which hopefully can catalyze and result in more ambitious NDCs. So it's really, I think in a certain sense, as Jenin said, the leadership comes from not from one level, but from all of us. So it's, I think if each and every one of us could take on the responsibility at our level to try to get the message out that we need a more ambitious NDCs. I think it would be, represent a good start to where it is we want to get to by 2020. So let me thank our panelists. I'd like to ask you to give them a round of applause. And let me thank you as the audience. You've been a good audience today. Some of you have been spending the entire day with us. And I want to ask our CEO, Dr. Bill, here to say a few words of thanks as we come to the end of the day. Bill, over to you. Uh, thank you, Leon. I just wanted to thank our panel um, for offering such great insights and um, personal viewpoints about this issue. I mean, the question of NDCs and, and uh, their enha and the enhancement of ambition is actually fundamental to the life of the Paris Agreement. Um, I heard uh, at the last session in Bonn, or the penultimate session in Bonn, I should say, having missed Bangkok, the first ever session of my life, um, <laughs> I heard many uh, parties begin to wonder, well, if we don't actually get to increase ambition, uh, what, what does this Paris Agreement mean? Uh, it was a sad thing to hear people say that, but countries are wondering, you know, what is happening to us? And I, I take uh, Ambassador Felsen's point about the, the barrier reef of Belize, the beautiful barrier reef, um, the government and people are out to protect it, but unless we are successful in actually getting the NDC ambition enhanced sufficiently, uh, that reef and many others simply won't survive. And the only, the only way of giving these reefs a chance is if we're able to limit warming to 1.5 degrees or below. So I think that the messages that we've heard today have been very much inside the process and how essential that is, but looking outside, uh, the risks are there. We can see if we don't actually succeed in what we've started in the Talanoa uh, dialogue process leading to the upgrading of ambition in 2020, then the Paris Agreement purpose is ultimately in question. But we're optimistic, we're moving forward, and you've heard everything today uh, at both sessions, if you're here, about how uh, we can still get to 1.5 degrees and how much it matters. So thanks once again uh, for your contributions, and thanks once again to the audience for coming and participating and asking such great questions. And look forward to seeing you again at Climate Week next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. If I make it to the RCC, then I can make it to the RCC. Thank you very much. I'm going to use my case.